Hi, so this video is about impulse and momentum conservation, and um, let's get right into it. Um, let's start off, first of all, by talking about the idea of, of impulse. And the, uh, the concept of impulse is actually a lot like the concept of, of work. Um, remember when we, um, we define work to be equal to a force acting on an object over some displacement. Um, when we talk about impulse, impulse is going to actually be a force acting on an object for a certain time period. Okay? So impulse is, um, is like the time version of work. And we'll see that the reason that it's important is because impulse causes the momentum to change. And we learned before that work was important because work causes the energy to change. So let's start off here with um, an isolated system. Um, or actually, I'm, let's just start off with an object here, a uh, mass. Okay, and uh, and we're going to push on that mass with a force. And um, for the purposes of our conversation now, we're going to assume that that force is external to the system. So that's our system. And this force is coming from the outside world. Um, that's a lot like what we did when we talked about uh, introducing the idea of work and how work changes kinetic energy. We talked about a force acting on a mass and over some distance. All right, so let's, let's start with that. Um, and what we're then going to look at is, let's go back to um, the uh, Newton's second law, which says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. And of course, these are vectors, force and acceleration. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use that to come up with impulse. Now, impulse involves force and time. And time is part of the second law, and it's going to be found inside of the acceleration part. So we're going to write this now. Um, I'm going to come over here and talk about an average force and the average force whoops, can be expressed as mass times um, a change in velocity over a change in time. And so the idea here is why is that, where am I using average? I'm using average because these are just intervals. So for some interval of delta t, the velocity is going to change by so much. And on average, the force that acts on the interval is going to be something. So I'm not getting really detailed and I'm not looking at the force and how it changes second by second. It's just kind of overall, what does it do during this interval? Okay. We'll look at the instantaneous force over on this side in just a second. But for now, let's start off with something more basic. Um, and so the idea then would be is we're going to take that delta t and we're just going to treat it like an algebra variable. We'll bring it over. And that leaves us with the product of force times the time interval is equal to mass times a change in velocity. And um, this is actually, this quantity um, that we have on the right side of the equation is oftentimes just referred to as a change in momentum. It's a vector here, it's a vector here. So in many, many cases, um, an object will change its momentum simply by changing its velocity, and the mass of the object does not change. We're going to limit ourselves to those types of situations here because that's most of the problems that we'll be interested in in this course. So we're replacing mass times delta V with delta P. And, and of course, the reason for that is that, that P is defined as m times v. So a change in P is going to be equal to mass times a change in velocity. Uh, over here, on the left side, we have this force times time interval, and that's actually what's called impulse. Um, there's a symbol for that that gets used in textbooks sometimes. I'm probably not going to use it all that often, but it is the letter J. And um, it's called impulse. And you can think of it as force times time.
Okay. Uh, like I said before, impulse is a lot like work, because remember, uh, work is equal to force times displacement. Work is a dot product of two vectors. It gives a scalar. Work is measured in joules. And that um, leads to changes in energy of some form, because joules of work change this in some way. Uh, in a very similar way, we talk about the, uh, the impulse acting on an object. And that is not a vector dot product. Impulse is basically the product of a vector force times the um, a time interval, which is a scalar. And uh, so it's a different kind of a thing. Momentum has a vector quality to it. Impulse has a vector quality to it. Energy does not. Work does not. And uh, the, the effect of having some type of impulse is that you're going to change the momentum in some way. Okay? So there's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels between these two things. Uh, what momentum brings to the table is direction. And energy did not have anything in it with direction. So, uh, so that's it. So uh, that's kind of basically the idea with impulse. Um, oftentimes uh, you see... Uh, we, talk, we talked last year about a trade-off. If you want to change something's momentum, how can you do it? Uh, I'll give a, just kind of a little graphic example here. Uh, if you're in your car and you're driving with some velocity and you, you kind of slowly stop your car so that you stop moving, so like kind of with gradual braking, you are you're clearly changing uh, your momentum by applying the brakes over that distance. Uh, and the idea here would be that you can achieve a change in momentum by applying a, a relatively small force over a very long time interval. And so my delta P here is going to be achieved by a, a small force, which is easy on the riders, but it's acting over a long time interval. And that's a good safe way to, uh, to brake. Now, the alternative way to brake in a car is to hit a wall or to stop very suddenly. So let's say that you're moving along here, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you hit a wall. Uh, in this case, you know, a lot, of, a lot of students would say, oh, your change in momentum is much different. And actually, that's not true. The change in momentum here is still just delta P, except you are now achieving it by applying a very large force on the car for a very short period of time. So the, the important point is that the delta P's are the same as long as your initial velocities were the same, but the way that you achieve that change in momentum can be done in drastically different ways, okay? with a lot of force or with not much. Um, and that's, that's kind of an important practical thing to think about um, when you think about uh, the, the impulse momentum relation. Okay, so this is sometimes called the impulse momentum relation. That you've got uh, force times delta t is actually equal to uh, your change in momentum. You could put an equal sign there. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's um, that's the deal with impulse uh, vector quantity. Uh, oh, going back to units, does it have units? I guess it does. Uh, I, I think that the best units for impulse are probably just going to be. I'll add them in up here. Uh, the impulse would be newtons times seconds. Those are pretty typical units. So average force times change in time, newtons times seconds. Um, you should also know that the impulse also has the same units as momentum itself, because whatever units you have on this side should be equivalent to the units on this side. So these should also be equal to kilograms times meters per second, and they are. And I would leave that up to you as a challenge, because a newton is actually built up of other units. Um, you know, from the second law, you know that a newton is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So when you multiply by seconds, you end up with, with that. So it's all good. All right, one other thing I'm going to go, I'm going to come back up to the top here, and I said, I said save some space here. <laughs> uh, what, if you're, what if you have a force and you want to be really specific about when it's acting? So you don't want an average force, but you want like a, an instantaneous force. And, of course, um, the difference would then be, instead of writing F average, you just write F. And then instead of writing delta V over delta T, you write the derivative dV dt. And by the way, that's a vector. That's acceleration. Uh, so still Newton's second law. 
except now you're just making it instantaneous. And if you do the same thing with it and you multiply the dt over, you get this. I'm going to take the vector symbols off for now, but you bring that over and you can recognize that's impulse over here. Uh, the difference now is that you can now integrate both sides to get rid of these dt and the dvs. So I, if I integrate f dt, right, from t1 to t2, that's going to give me the impulse acting on the object. And then that would be equal to essentially um, mass times the change in velocity here. Okay. And um, so the integral of velocity from kind of v1 to v2. But v1 to v2, when you integrate, it's just the difference between, right? So this becomes m times v2 minus v1. That's just m times delta v, which is just delta p. So bottom line, end of the day, is that you can still find the change in momentum for an object when you're given the force uh, if you know that the force is some function of time. So what you would have to input into this would be a function, right? F is a function of t, and then you would have to integrate it to find a change in momentum. So this is sometimes necessary when the force is changing with time. Um, it's not necessary if the force is constant. So for example, if you're talking about the weight force, like F is equal to mg, there's really no need to integrate that. You could, and it would work, but if you're talking about the weight force causing a change in momentum, it's much easier to go back over here and just deal with it algebraically. However, if you have a force that does something like this, where the force is equal to, I don't know, A times T plus B, where A and B are constants, and the force is getting stronger with time, then you would have to integrate it to find a change in momentum. So uh, just to point that out, I'll have you do some practice with it. But it's, a, it's basically just an integral. Uh, and again, that's very much like the idea that work was equal to the integral of force with respect to position. And that causes a, um, a change in kinetic energy. Okay, if this is the net force, I should say. If it's the net force, then it causes a change in kinetic energy. So, our big, uh, our big thing here is going to be the definition of impulse. Um, impulse is, e is, is a vector quantity. And let's just loosely think about impulse as being the product of force times time. And um, the, the importance of impulse is that when you have an impulse acting on an object, that is going to cause the momentum to change in some very specific way. So this is called the impulse-momentum relation, this one right here. All right, so then you've got some practice for applying that.